Okay. Um, so I'm particularly interested in how Jung and Steiner fit together. Uh, and in particular, how they fit together to help us right now. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into like uh, a figure like Steiner, like a lot of like kind of higher planning that goes into their guidance and their mission and how they're given everything they need to carry out their work in the world. And the same thing with Jung. And, and uh, it's, it's very ironic that they never actually uh, knew each other in, in life because their missions are absolutely destined to unlock each other. Because you can't really understand Steiner unless you understand Jung. And I think that you actually need, and, but in order to really understand Steiner, you need Jung there. They, they really unlock each other, which I'll, which I'll talk about, how, like how they unlock each other. Um, but one of the reasons I think Steiner never really thought much of Jung cause, is uh, Steiner was like, like out on the front lines of like the Western esoteric battle for good. And he was attacked like viciously by like the evil occultists and, and like poisoned and he, he died early, you know, or he died kind of prematurely. And so when Steiner was at the forefront of this battle revealing all of this knowledge because he was tapped into the highest streams of esoteric wisdom. I mean, he, we know that he, that, he, that he met Blavatsky, but we don't know who his real teacher was, you know, and we can't really talk about that because his real teacher was so important that he'd ever revealed himself to the public. He just like trained the initiates that were destined to like change the world. So like Steiner was tapped into the very highest mm. streams of knowledge. And Jung is this like resilient shamanistic, like uh, self-initiated psychologist. And, and Jung didn't really start going through that until uh, World War I. At the same time, Steiner's like, look, I, I can see who's starting World War I. It's, th it's these people and these people and these people. And it's a conspiracy and it's an attack, an occult attack on human freedom. And meanwhile, Jung is like breaking from Freud like a little boy and like going into his like crisis, his shamanic initiation. Uh, and so it was only when Jung came out of that that he actually had anything to add to Steiner's work. Uh, so by the time he came out of that, uh, he was just getting started, and Steiner was like fighting his final battles, you know. And so th they never they never uh, connected, but their work is like destined to connect. And like when it connects, it's like this chain reaction, because they've been given like missions to bring, to kind of they both collect the esoteric wisdom from the ages and then rebirth it in a way that's really plugged in to the needs of the time. So, so Jung was like subconsciously doing this, and Steiner was hyper-consciously doing it. He knew exactly what he was doing, and Jung was being very intuitively guided by his, like, his higher self and whatever spiritual guidance he was receiving. Um, so they specialized in different realms, okay? And to, 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 to use some bridge terms here, I'm going to create a bridge concept. Uh, the soul is analogous to the psyche. So when we say soul, we're talking about psyche. When we're saying psyche, we mean soul. Uh, and which in occultism, we have a, a term for that too. It's called the astral body. Okay, the astral body is the same as the psyche, is the same as the soul. And this is what Jung really specialized in the science of the, of the soul, the science of the psyche, the science of the astral body. Steiner was one of those like, ultra geniuses who like mapped out the spirit world in such detail he's like okay well there's various levels to the spirit world like there's the uh the first realm we encounter which is the astral realm that's the realm of the soul he's like but then you got to go through that you got to get to the other side of that on the other side there's like another level of the spirit world and then that's inhabited by these beings and then there's another level by these beings and then you get to here and then there's these divine beings and these beings are guiding the evolution of humanity Okay, like um, nobody could even come close to like being able to confirm what he was saying or anything. He was just so far ahead of everybody. Jung was like um, going into going into the past, and Jung and, and Steiner was like trailblazing for the future. And it's only now that we're able to really start unpacking Jung. And Jung is like really ripe now. How many people are, are know the Red Book? Mm -hmm. Show of hands for the Red Book who've like seen it, have heard of it. And seen the art in it. Um, it's uh, this is like a record of Jung's shamanistic initiation. Um, 
uh, that was very much him going into the astral realm. And so his initiation was like an initiation into the, into the astral realm. And Steiner is marked by the fact that he's kind of like bringing down knowledge from realms that are even higher than that. So the thing is, is the way they fit together. Steiner is like the science, scientist of the spirit, Jung is scientist of the soul. The soul realm comes before the spirit realm. You have, you have to do work on your soul body, your astral body, before you can actually reliably access the realms above that. And if you don't do this preliminary work on your soul body, you're going to go, you're going to like enter in a really dysfunctional way into the higher realms. Like you're going to, if you haven't done a certain amount of shadow work, for example, then when you go up into the higher realms, you're going to magnetize all these like big shadow beings. And like you're going to draw things to yourself that are just reflections of the work that still needs to be done on your, on your soul body. Uh, so they're both like uh, gathering up all the occult wisdom of their age and like resynthesizing it. But Jung was doing this like instinctually, and it started with this idea of what I call the shamanic archetype. Jung had this kind of soul that was predisposed to have a shamanic calling, to be a soul doctor, to be a, one who walks in, in both worlds, who has one foot in the soul world or the astral world and one foot in the material world. And uh, he had this like very archetypal shamanistic initiation experience. Like he started having visions like spontaneously. He once he had his break with Freud uh, over basically like Freud was an atheist materialist and, and Jung is this like mystical shaman and, and so the naturally he split. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and and so Jung uh, w his initiation was a descent into the underworld or like the world of the, the unconscious but like what is the unconscious that's such a deficient word it just means like it's not conscious it's something but it's just not consciousness so then what is it uh, to, to bridge that with like uh, Steiner's terminology you would say it's it's the parts of the astral body that are just not yet awakened is the parts of the astral body that are still sleeping or that are still kind of tied to the lower realms. And uh, so Jung's initiation was to go down. And one of the things that's down in the lower realms of the astral is like this sort of ancestral memory. Because part of Jung's mission was to retrieve this ancestral uh, wisdom and lineage, uh, the kind of Western civilization's own shamanistic lineage course didn't realize this at the time he was just conducting an experiment on himself he was a scientist he's like oh I'm hearing voices I'm having visions like let's see where this goes I'm gonna document it mm -hmm. and then he goes for it dives into it and documents the whole thing and that documentation is the red book um, but he was unguided by some high initiate or some esoteric master where Steiner was guided by the best of the best so so Jung is like reaching down and Steiner's reaching up and they're really destined to like come together. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jung dives into uh, into like his own personal underworld, and <coughs> with that also the past. And like through his kind of five six year initiatory passage, he 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 could only unpack this later on in life. He spent the rest of his life unpacking this, and it was out of this initiatory experience that arose his entire psychology. Uh, but he didn't know about alchemy yet. And he only discovered alchemy later on in his life. But when he discovered it, he instantly recognized it as the historical parallel to his psychology. And the reason for that is because he is, he just didn't realize it at the time, but he is an initiate in the hermetic lineage. He, his soul, his higher self, is an initiate in this lineage. And his role is to be a new link in the chain. Because this lineage has to journey across various civilizations starts in Atlantis, goes to Egypt, starts in, it goes from Egypt to the, to the Middle East, it, it goes into Europe and then it gets persecuted by the church, so it flees to the Arabic civilization and, and then it comes back through Spain and then it reemerges in the Renaissance and then it goes underground with Rosicrucianism and then, it, and then it gets corrupted and then it emerges through Steiner again. And so it's this lineage that's just <laughs> weaving back and forth and, and surviving every attempt to eradicate it because it, it, it keeps reinventing itself through people like Jung. So people like Jung, they're not tapped by some sort of master, they're, they're actually going through their own call to their, uh, their higher self. They're just answering the call of their higher self, and they're going through this process, and in the process they're doing this kind of soul retrieval on the hermetic lineage. 
So Jung was this like uh, unconscious alchemist who became eventually a conscious alchemist, and his whole psychology is just a revisioning of alchemy. It's 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 alchemy put in new terminology. It's alchemy revisioned for a new uh, age in a new language to suit the modern needs of the modern times, to suit you know the people that are having uh, identity crises, existential crises in Europe at the time. Um, so, uh, he didn't know, like, consciously that he was doing this. But now when we look back at it now and the Red Book comes out, because the Red Book wasn't even published until, like, 2007. So up until then, Jung had this completely other mystical side that people kind of heard about and suspected but didn't fully understand the full extent of, oh, my God, this guy was such a shaman, like, seriously. And he kept his hidden. Because he was like a double agent. He had his mission, right? He had his mission to kind of save psychoanalysis from materialism. Mm. He had to sneak in all of this esoteric, hermetic, alchemical wisdom into the emerging field of psychology. And in order to do that, he had to speak in the language of the time. The language of the time was this very scientific, you could only use as your data, like things like dreams. And so he worked with the artifacts of the psyche. And that, that was the... The substance of his science was was the, the stuff of the subconscious stuff that comes up in dreams and fantasies, and and neuroses and complexes and where there's all this like tangled mass, and he took people into it because he was initiated almost like a shaman. He could guide people into these realms and help do this kind of psychological soul retrieval work. Um, so the crowning of Jung's career was that he that he that he like healed a lineage that was like split off that was actually viciously kind of attacked and exterminated by this impulse of the church that is that hiding behind that impulse is a really evil impulse and it was like um, trying to cut off that lineage and so Jung kind of like went back into the past and retrieved it and like rebirthed it again and so now through Jung we have this access now in a modern language to this whole lineage of hermetic wisdom and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's put forward in this way that we can access now to, to, to help us in what we're going through right now. And uh, if you look at like sort of any shamanistic initiation, it begins with a crisis. So what happens when you have like the whole civilization going through a crisis? You have like all the sensitive souls or all the old souls are each going through a shamanistic initiation. I'm sure everybody here has their narrative of like the first time they had like a, a major breakdown and then their first mystical rebirth and then the time that they, they, they talked to spirits and the time they had this mystical this and that and that and, and, and you, you each have like your narratives and they're all kind of um, um, following this shamanistic pattern of initiation. And so that's what Jung's work really gives us is like how to, how to do this kind of deep work on the realm of ourself that can be called our astral body. So what is the astral body? Astral body contains our desires. The astral body contains our karma. The astral body contains our pain and our joy, our ecstasy and our hopes and dreams. And it contains what we call like our humanity, like uh, our emotions. And it also contains like our trauma. And this is very important. Like, like when, when tr trauma happens to us, it actually splits our astral body. You know, and, uh, and then the split gets tied up with dark forces, and then it becomes a, a dark fragment, and then we have to go on a, a kind of shamanistic mission to, to retrieve it. And this is what modern-day psychotherapy can, in best-case scenario, do for us. But this is also the territory of shamanism and shamanistic healing. This is what you can also accomplish in entheogenic ceremony, properly guided. Um, and so this is Jung's territory is very much the shamanistic, emerging shamanistic realm. And it also is, is very related to entheogenic work. Because the alchemists were entheogenic initiates of Western Europe. Nobody realizes this because they didn't talk about it because they'd be killed if they talked about it. But they were secretly like eating mushrooms and, and, and doing all of this uh, transformative work on themselves. And if you look at the artwork... You know, if you know, like, you look at the artwork, you're like, yes, these people were definitely tripping. And uh, you, you instantly recognize, like, a brother, like, right there, you know, if that's, if that's your thing. And uh, <laughs> it is with me. Right? Um, so, so that's like, 
So this is why Jung is, Jung is like really important for us right now because like we don't have any shamanistic elders. We have to go to indigenous peoples if we want to be initiated into the spirit world or if we want to do soul retrieval work on ourselves. We have to like find a shaman somewhere, but like who are these shamans and where are they coming from and what is their lineage? And it's like we don't have like our own Western lineage, but we do. It's Jung. Jung is actually like a, a legitimate shaman elder in our like Western esoteric lineage. If you know how to like sort of tap into him. Uh, so, so this is Jung is really popular right now, and Jung and Steiner is not that popular right now because we haven't caught up with Steiner yet, because we haven't got Jung deeply enough yet to understand how badly we need Steiner. Mm -hmm. See, like people are like. Uh, Oh, Jung is all I need, and that's what I thought. Like Jung, Jung, ha, Jung is the alchemical doctrine. It's the hermetic lineage. It's all we need. There's nothing missing. Like I'll do my shadow work, no problem. <laughs> no, <laughs> like uh, there's something really crucial missing from mm -hmm. from Jung that Steiner provides. Uh, but but we're still at this stage of like starting to understand the importance of Jung, and Steiner Steiner's day won't even come for another like hundred years. Like he's so ahead of his time that we're just beginning to lay the foundation now for starting to grasp Steiner. Uh, but they need to flow into each other. So, so, that, so Jung is, is helping us right now, but hopefully there's a kind of uh, bridging that takes place where people kind of, because they're put, they're, like their work has been given to us for a very specific reason by like a universe full of divine wisdom. And like, uh, they're, they, they, they're like links in a chain. So once we get Jung and his theory of individuation is basically the science of how to prepare your astral body. How to do the work you need to do on your astral body in order to reliably enter higher realms. Realms of like the divine, like the creator and like divine beings and beings that are actually guiding humanity's spiritual evolution, whether we realize it or not. And uh, if we try to enter those realms prematurely, uh, we kind of mistake them for the, for for like like uh, the soul realms. So so if we don't if we don't have Steiner and Jung together, and we're just with we're just working with Jung, we're gonna have all these kinds of visionary experiences, but we won't know how to interpret them properly. Sorry. We'll mistake an archetype for a divine being. We'll mistake a projection of our shadow with like we'll we'll mistake there. Basically, until we've done this this initial round of individuation work. We don't have the organs of perception, we don't have the right discernment, and we don't have proper protection mm -hmm. from the very real dangers that exist in the initiatory process. I mean, it's a world full of, of deceptions and mm -hmm. subtle, subtle, subtle deceptions. Like, uh, their spirits lie, like spirits deceive. Spirits weave incredible visions and give us visions and we buy it. And if we don't have like a higher level of initiation that Steiner can tap us into, then we'll totally misinterpret and we'll go on to this pathological direction of shamanistic initiation and we'll become like sorcerers without even realizing it. We are really inflated and like really over identify ourselves with God and like get into this, this fuzzy, confusing territory where we're over identifying with archetypes. And it's because we haven't done the necessary soul work at this initial level of what's beyond the physical realm. So there's just various levels, right? So. If we, if we follow the teachings of Jung and do the kind of work of individuation, then we're, then we're making ourselves prepared to enter into Steiner. And then when we enter into Steiner, we, we reach this like um, prophetic level, really. Like Jung was a prophet in, in as much as he was like embodying something that we're all needing to go through now. Like we all need to do what Jung did. Often, like self-initiation, like self-guided. Uh, you know, we often I didn't have elders and to help me when I started experimenting with entheogens and thinking I was a shaman and, and getting in big trouble. Like, you know, I, I elders could have really saved me from that, but I didn't have that. Neither did Jung, but that gave me something really precious, and that that's like important, and that's a condition that we, I think, are, are faced with right now. It's like a uniquely modern condition that we're in. Um, but, so, so Steiner, uh, Steiner was Christian, and uh, he, see, the thing is, is that uh, <clears throat> alchemy was, uh, was evolving in a certain direction, and the doctrine of the Philosopher's Stone was evolving in a certain direction, 
And uh, at the highest level of, of European alchemy, and the, the Rosicrucian alchemists of the 1500s and 1600s, they were like mystical, shamanic, entheogenic, scientific, artist Christians. <laughs> They were like shamanic Christians, and, 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 and they believed in Christ, and, and they thought he was God. And the, to them, the Philosopher's Stone was, is totally inseparable from Christ within. Like, it's the same, same thing. So that's Steiner. You know, Steiner was bringing that. He was talking about Christ all the time. And, but he was, like, he was speaking from a, from a lineage of, like, the esoteric lineage of Christianity, mm -hmm. which nobody knew about because it's been so successfully exterminated. And so it was carried on in secret through the alchemists. Mm. Uh, but uh, so Jung was talking about Christ very cautiously, only speaking of it in terms of an archetype and linking it with something that everybody can experience, mm. like the I am. Then there's Steiner talking about how there are these beings in these higher realms and they come down to earth. And this one special being came down to earth and incarnated in the body and, and, and died and, and joined itself with the whole earth and became the spirit of the earth and is now destined to return again through the plant world. And he's talking this like very high level prophecy. And, um, you know, so, so, so the, the paradox now is that the people that are drawn to, to Jung are like the shamanic individuals, right? And the shamanic souls that have this spontaneous kind of initiatory uh, journey in this lifetime were probably burned at the stake in a past lifetime. And so there's this like real deep-seated like... Uh, I'm okay with, 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 you know, with, with alchemy, but like I, Christianity, stay, keep your space over here, please. Like, no, thank you. Like, I don't want to be burned at the stake again. Like, uh, and, 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 and um, so now there's this kind of, you, you're split now. You've got like the Jungian devotees who are like all about the collective unconscious and the archetypes and the individuation <laughs> process and the empowerment of the I and the self. And uh, they'll only, they're only okay with, with, with like the basic uh, mythology of Christianity insofar as it's just a symbol for their self. And uh, if you stay in that, you're actually going to go astray. Because hiding in the self, or other, like Steiner talks about how there are these divine beings, like there's, a, there's Christ, there's another one called Lucifer. And it's not, it's not what, uh, what, what, a lot of, what the church made Lucifer out to be. Lucifer's like the light bearer. Okay, and, and, and Steiner said that he actually gives humanity divine knowledge, you know, but before, you're, before we're ready for it. And so it's a temptation and, and we fall because, like, because we, don't, we get inflated, we don't know how to handle it, we get pathological. And he even went so far as to say, because Steiner was so clairvoyant, he said, like, you know, if you look back, like, in the times of Lemuria, you'll find, you'll discover that that, that was when Lucifer embedded himself in the human astral body. And so now every astral body carries a reflection of Lucifer in it. And, and, you know, I'm always looking to bridge concepts, right? So when I look at Jung and how he talks about how in the individuation process, there's this natural process of inflation. And it inevitably leads to alienation. And it inevitably leads to, uh, like, a, a big smackdown from, like, your environment. Like, when you act like a big tyrant and then, like, you just get humbled, right? Um, but, you know, Steiner thought that, that he saw that as the reflection of Lucifer in the human astral body. And so there's this problem of this, like, inflationary, uh, like, uh, um, prideful and, like, imbalanced aspect of the astral body. So the astral body actually has this, like, anatomical character in it that if we don't do this magical alchemical work on it, it will actually lead us astray. So this is where the doctrine of alchemy comes in. You have to capture it in a vessel. If you don't capture it in a vessel, it'll, it'll go all over the place and you'll, you'll ruin, like your whole astral development will go into chaos and get ruined. Uh, and if it's not permeated by higher forces, then you yourself will go into this kind of luciferic inflation. You'll, you'll think you're a god man and you'll become a charlatan and you'll become a new age like sorcerer. So, so we need this, these ideas that, that Steiner brings in, but he's not, like, he doesn't pull any punches. He says it's the Christ impulse. And he says that, like, without, without the Christ impulse, the Luciferic impulses in the human soul will ruin the whole developmental process. And uh, so there's this, this need to, like, to bring in the, the actual, like, Gnostic experience of Christ 
with these uh, with uh, with a group of people that have been so heavily traumatized by Christianity over like the millennia that they actually want nothing to do with it, and they've gone in the opposite direction. But if you go too far in the opposite direction, you'll also go astray. Mm -hmm. So so like the 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 solution to this is to find how Steiner and Jung really like work together like this for the betterment of like our our evolution uh so so this is this is why you know you know, steiner's not that popular nobody really wants to like sit in a room and talk about christ it's just like <laughs> it's just not cool you know? <laughs> but like to talk about like entheogenic visions and like shamanic rites of passage it's the everybody loves that <laughs> you know so, so what, what, like, what, what would, but, but then, like, see, see, for me, I was heavily experienced by the fact that, like, I wo dove into this, like, wildly pagan shamanic initiation with, like, incredibly irresponsible use of entheogens and, like, and, and other forces that they were awakening in me, like the kundalini forces and things like that, and I was just, like, a mess, thinking I was some, like, like, big man, and I was just actually getting myself wrapped up in all manner of, like, bad things um, so that's that's the work I'm trying to do now you know be, and trying to like do this bridge work between Jung and Steiner because they're they're destined to flow together and uh, we, we can't even really understand how important Steiner is until we until we really kind of are initiated into Jung but that'll only take us so far and we need something else to enter in so I think I'll stop there yeah. For the moment, for the moment. Yeah, let's give him a little click on applause. Uh, so this, this year I've been working on launching uh, this online school. It's called the School of Modern Soul Science. <laughs> so uh, just to give you a sense of the, the, the vision of the school, I'll, I'll do a, a really quick kind of biographical thread, uh, autobiographical thread. Um, I had a, when I was in university, I had a kind of... Um, I, and it, what Jung would call an individuation crisis. I had an ego breakdown, and then my uh, archetypal subconscious became hyperactive, and I became quite manic and quite visionary and quite like ecstatic in my ways. And like uh, I was just basically, you know, as I joke, like kind of drawing sacred geometry on the walls, and uh, I was getting downloads of, of the universe's wisdom, and, and you get the idea, right? And uh, <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> and. Uh, I was like, what is going on? You know, uh, I, th I thought I was having a kind of mental breakdown. And, uh, but then I discovered Jung, and Jung wasn't taught. I went to Yale University, which is supposedly this really good university, but they only taught Freud. And I had to encounter Jung at the very end from this grad student in religious studies. He was in the, di the Div School, <laughs> the Divinity School, and he was teaching an optional s uh, seminar about mysticism, and I found out about Jung through that. Uh, right at the end, and when I when I discovered Jung, his theory of individuation clicked exactly with what I was going through, and I was like, okay, that's it. I really glommed on that. That's what I'm going through. I'm going through this individuation crisis. Okay, whew. okay. And so I got really into Jung, and I graduated, and, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. So um, I also Jung obviously led into Joseph Campbell. You know, I started reading about uh, the, the hero with a thousand faces and the hero's journey, and I was looking at the parallels between Jung and mythology, and I was analyzing lots of movies and working creatively, filling lots of journals with creative work. So that was a really healthy outlet for this individuation crisis I was going through, because I had all these images all the time and all these inspirations, and so I had this discipline of capturing it in, in journals and things like that. Um, <clears throat> And then that led me to discover the idea of entheogens and, and shaman, what I thought was like shamanism. And uh, I, my first encounter with shamanism was, was not through any lineage. It was through like me experimenting with entheogens in my basement and uh, like attempting to self-initiate. And, uh, and I thought, what I thought shamanism was was take a big dose of mushrooms and uh, boom, I'll go into the spirit world and I'll be a shaman. And like, great. You know? Don't try this and at home. Don't, alone. don't, I did it alone and like, don't do it. Um, <laughs> don't do what I did. And yeah, anyway. Um, so, so that like a year or so later, I mean, that led me to like Burning Man and, and like lots of, lots of different kinds of psychedelics and lots of, experimentations and all manner of things and uh, 
I really got into a bad place doing that. And uh, that, like, you know, I, I basically put my soul in more mortal danger doing that. And then, so then, the, the because the, I was missing the missing piece, and that was the lineage. And the lineage to all of this work was the hermetic lineage of alchemy. So uh, I was in such trouble that I kind of took recourse and like, I need some elders, but I couldn't find any elders. But I found, I looked, I went back to Jung and I saw that Jung, Jung's elders were like the, the alchemists of the ages. And so I went back into alchemy and I rediscovered something that I had missed the first time I looked at it, this impulse that was present in the Rosicrucian alchemy. Uh, and that kind of came alive in me and uh, started to illuminate uh, my soul and also illuminate the, the mysteries of alchemy. So I went through these four phases, Jungian psychology, which led to creative visionary art, creative mythology, which led to entheogenic shaman, like non-indigenous, like archetypal, I call it archetypal shamanism. And, uh, and that, and that was, was kind of rounded off by tapping into the Western shamanic lineage of alchemy. So those are the four pillars of the school. So in the School of Modern Soul Science, we, we sort of pursue these four disciplines at once. And the subject is the initiation of the soul, or like the, the, the development of the astral body, so that we can sort of be citizens of the, of the higher realms. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to do that, so that's what we're all going through. We're all going through uh, initiation, and this is a school devoted to the science of that initiation in such a way that it taps us into the modern needs of the modern soul facing the modern crisis. So like, just like Jung made alchemy really relevant to his time and Steiner made Rosicrucian philosophy really relevant to his time, I'm attempting to make like, uh, all of this, this work highly relevant to our, our contemporary crisis and, our, and the needs of our soul living in this culture here mm -hmm. at this time. And so the subject is like the science of initiation and the soul is the subject. And we approach it from these four different disciplines at once. So one section will be like, you know, write your shamanic <coughs> initiatory narrative. The next section is like, uh, now analyze the alchemy of it. Then the next section is like, now create a bunch of visionary art about it. And then, uh, and then the final is now analyze, like analyze yourself. So these four elements kind of hit the subject at these various ways and they really unlock the magic in each other.